<laughs> so in other words, it's what goes on your mobile phone rather than what necessarily radiates from it. So this week, Norma, we actually have questions from Beck and Ruby who are both asking about mobile phone radiation. Beck wants to know what the science says about whether mobile phones really do cause cancer. And Ruby's asking along a similar line saying, given that we have this piece of technology on us nonstop, I want to know what the health effects are beside the fact that most of us are addicted. Is there any evidence to suggest that our phones emit radiation or the like? And what effect does this have on our health? Well, we can kind of cover off part of Ruby's question straight away because, of course, mobile phones do emit radiation. They're just The question is, is that a problem? And radiation's got its own fears because radiation can cause cancer, but it's only certain kinds of radiation and it's on a spectrum. So let's just deal with mobile phones for a moment. The, spect- the part of the radiation spectrum or the electromagnetic ra- spectrum, sort of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum that it's on, is up towards radio waves. These are radio receivers and transmitters. So the radio waves that are being transmitted. Now, there's no question that if you've got high energy radio waves, um, they're used to, for instance, seal um, plastic bags. You know, that, 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 that hot that what? heat comes from radio waves. Um, doctors can use radio waves to control bleeding inside the body. So radio waves what? can be high. <laughs> I didn't yeah. know this. Yeah, they, 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 can, they can basically churn up the molecules. Could they use us? And, and, sorry? Could they use us? Like we're on the radio. Yeah, we're... <laughs> we're sealing your wounds. That's right. Watch us, we're coming <laughs> at you. So radio waves can, in high, with high energy, cause a lot of heat and cause damage um, to our bodies. But the key when you're talking about radiation is it's highly technical. It's the size of the waveform, in other words, that it comes in and the uh, energy that's in the waves. So when you've got uh, a radio frequency heater, that's incredibly intense radio waves that are so strong that they actually heat tissue um, or can heat plastic and seal it. But when it's in the form of, of a phone, it's incredibly low energy, although sometimes you can feel the phone being warm. Like, is it? tell me if this is a good analogy or not. If I'm saying something at this in this tone of like this You're giving note. me cancer, yeah. <laughs> but I could say, I could I could basically like sing a C softly and I'm not going to because I don't have perfect pitch or I could sing it really loudly. It's the same wavelength. It's just a different amplitude. Yeah, the intensity, the intensity changes. It's the easier way to think about it. So at the extreme end of the electromagnetic spectrum, you have radioactivity, so-called ionizing radiation, where the wavelength is so small with so much energy, it actually can damage atoms and molecules in our body, cause genetic mutations, cause cancer, kill cells, which is why it's also used to treat cancer. So that's ionizing radiation. Where radio waves sit and our domestic electrical supply is in non-ionizing radiation. In other words, this radiation isn't of the such a short wavelength which is interacting with molecules in our body and it's also of low um, energy so that it generally of low energy so it's it's not knocking off electrons and damaging individual molecules. Yes, you could get heating but it's not doing that cancer cause, it's not having that cancer causing effect. Okay, so when we're looking at the the electromagnetic spectrum and we've got visible light in the middle and on the higher, shorter wavelengths, we've got ultraviolet light and it goes up to microwaves and whatnot. On the other end, we've got infrared and it goes down to radio waves. Where do mobile phone, where does mobile phone radiation fit in to that spectrum? So mobile phones are radio waves. Of different, of different sizes. Um, and so as mobile phones have developed, the wavelength has shortened. Now, when they shorten, they do carry a bit more energy, but they are pretty low energy phones, but it's, it's on the radio wave end of the spectrum. So I didn't realise until I started looking into this that when we talk about like 3G or 4G, the G stands for generation. So 1G was the first generation and then 2G was the second generation. I thought it was like... A, a, a G, a G, like a giga something. <laughs> a gigahertz. A giga something, I yeah. don't know what. Anyway, so there has been a lot of concern about 5G technology coming in because that's the newest one that we've got. Is there anything about the G and the risk or you're saying there's no risk? Well, 
let's just separate it out from the physics. As the mobile phones have developed from 3, 4 and 5G, the frequencies have gone up. So you, you, do, ha you, you do have shorter waveforms. In theory, they could re interact with the body. But the reality is that the energy level is in incredibly low. You, you're, you're using your phones for maybe an hour or two a day. We now know how much our... Oh, gosh, more than feedback. like think about how close your phone is to your body throughout 24 hours, especially if it's like next to your head while you're sleeping. Like the dose, the exposure is very high. The exposure is high, but the energy level is low. And the energy level is really what counts here. So if you were to be next to a very high energy radio frequency source that could heat up your body and damage tissues. Um, yes, sometimes your mobile phone warms up but it, there, there is no evidence that that is having any effect on your body. Now, if there was, you would expect huge effects epidemiologically. This is what I was going to say. In a way, for better or worse, it's something that we can measure from within our lifetimes because this technology is so recent and it's so ubiquitous. So you would think that if there was an, an increase in, say, brain cancer from someone holding the phone to their ear – you would expect to see brain cancers on that dominant side if the phone was there and you would expect to see a similar curve in incidence against the increase in phone use. I, I haven't seen studies that look like that. It's very hard to ascribe cause and effect when you've got this uh, exposure to something that's so generalised. But nonetheless, you would expect if there was a brain cancer effect of mobile phones, you would see significant increases in the rate of brain cancer around the world. And you're not. And there have been some very big studies into this and independent studies. So there, there's no epidemic of malignant glioblastoma. Um, that's the type of brain cancer. That's the nasty form of, of brain cancer. There have been some questions about a, a benign tumour of the brain called an acoustic neuroma which is called a benign tumour in a malignant position because it's buried inside the brain. Therefore, to remove it can be quite a damaging operation. The tumour itself isn't the problem. It's getting it out. Getting it out is the yeah. problem, yeah. It, it causes deafness and so on. And the um, you know, and again, the data are not there to show there's been an epidemic of acoustic neuromas. Some people would say, oh, well, you haven't seen it yet because it can take 20 years for cancers to develop. But you, to your point, they've been around long enough that if there was going to be an effect... Do they fry your brain and cause dementia? Well, actually, dementia rates are falling. Your chances of getting dementia relative to your age are lower now than they've ever been. Yeah, the number of people with dementia has increased because we're, there's more of us and we're getting older, but That's the right. actual rate per 100 people is, is lower than it was. So if you look at it in all its form, in, in all dimensions, one is that the... Um, Yes, it's radio waves. In theory, it could interact with your tissue, but the, the energy level is low. And then when you look at the epidemiology, the patterns of disease in population, we're not seeing any warning signs. I feel like on What's That Rash, we're usually talking about something that doesn't have a lot of evidence that people are sort of trying to drum up evidence for, like a supplement or something like that. And with this, it's like the opposite. We've got lots and lots of really big studies in multiple countries. It's global data that we can look at. And there still persistently is not the link that people were worried about 20 years ago. And I wonder if it has something to do with the fact that you kind of alluded to it before. We get scared by things that we don't understand. Like I can't see a radio wave or I can see, I can see visible light and that's all I can see. And anything that sits outside of that visible spectrum, I trust that it exists because I learned about it in school. It obviously works because I can make calls on my phone, but it's scary to know that there's something bouncing around that we don't understand. And we also, in addition to that, we are the research, the, the psychological research into risk and our perception of risk is that if we perceive somebody to be profiting from taking risks with our health, our level of distress and anger and outrage go up. Um, so that's one of the things about pesticides is you know, you're putting pesticides on food. These big companies are making money out of pesticides. Can we trust them? No, we can't is what people believe, you know, many people would believe. And therefore, we think pesticides are bad. Interestingly, we don't, the, the feeling about mobile phones and cancer is not as pervasive as it is 
about pesticides, even though the telecommunications companies are making money out of it. Apple and uh, Google and whoever else makes you know the Android phones and so on, they're profiting out of it. But we don't seem to read it into that. The, the one group that seems to be, um, prob- in my view, quite rightly, pro- uh, suffering a problem from mobile phone use are the social media companies. Well, <laughs> so in other words, it's what goes on your mobile phone rather than what necessarily radiates from it. Right. So the the health, the bigger health harm with our phones is what we're consuming What's rather than What's on that the... damn screen. Yeah, that's fair right. enough. You know, it's really and the time spent on the screen that's not spent chatting to another human being oh, or a child <laughs> playing in the garden. Yeah, okay. So the health harms are... Co- are so the health harms associated with mobile phones that you're worried about are more about the social impacts than the the radiation. We will continue to shorten the wavelength of the radio frequency that's coming out of these phones, that's communicating with these phones. And we are bathed in it, but there is no evidence that that actually is doing us any harm. Because the smaller the wavelength gets, the more information we can transmit more quickly, and that's why it's appealing. This whole idea of us fearing things that we don't understand, like sometimes I wonder what people thought about like the printing press or the wheel. <laughs> Were or people scared of pen. wheels? Well, tell me about the fountain pen. The fountain pen was associated with um, arm and hand pain. When the computer was introduced, we got an outbreak of arm and oh, hand pain. I remember pain. T- people talking about Tetris thumb or something like that. Yeah, well, the, the, the when computers were introduced into some workplaces, you had people um, really being quite crippled by their arm and hand pain. And when they looked at the ergonomic position of this, we spoke about this before actually on What's mm. That Rash, the ergonomic position, the lighting, the style of the, made almost no difference. It was actually where when technology had been imposed without coming back to this idea of control and somebody benefiting from changing our world. Well, I was reading a story about aristocrat, aristocrats in the sort of 17th to 19th century having, not that frequently, but there were cases, multiple cases of people with something that they called glass delusion, where they thought that part of their body or all of their body was made of glass and then they were terrified of breaking, shattering and it was around the time that glassware was becoming more accessible to these people and of course you see a glass break and it's a catastrophic breakage and you can't put it back together again and I wonder if an anxiety about your own fragility sort of translates into this technology that you see and whether it's kind of the same sort of thing again where it's it's something new it's something that kind of reminds you about being human in a way that we are impermanent gosh i'm getting very philosophical but that new, anything new challenges us to relook at the way we interact with the world and i wonder if in another 10 15 20 years time we'll look back on this anxiety around mobile phones and laugh that we ever were worried about it yeah i, I think that's that's quite possible i actually don't think the anxiety is that high because we're all using them, mm. we're not stopping using them, we're not abandoning them en masse. So I think we're all getting over it pretty quickly. Uh, there are some people who have concerns and who see conspiracy um, there. That you, when you have your COVID-19 injection, they're implanting a 5G oh, stop rem- reminding uh, us. Um, chip in your body and they're going to monitor you around. I mean, these are incremental changes in technologies, which really are just about changing the wavelength of the radio wave that your, your phone is receiving from the local phone tower. And uh, yep, there's more information in that, but that's what allows us to watch movies on our phones and uh, communicate quite in quite sophisticated ways. Um, where they're much more like computers than, than than the brick that I started. We started a conversation with. So, we're we're not as anxious about it as we seem like we are. The health worries that we thought were there are not there. What should we be worrying about instead? What's the next thing that's new that we're going to start freaking out about? Space travel. It will totally be space travel. I reckon it will you're be. Right. Right. Oh, yeah, everyone's obsessed with going to space. And you and I see those, like, space health stories I think a few through. people would want to send into space. You know, they, <laughs> As our guinea pigs. That's right. So any parting words for Beck and Ruby then? First thing I'd say is anxiety about mobile phones is not misplaced. I mean, it's, it's reasonable to be sceptical about new technologies. But when you investigate here really nothing turns up, thankfully, because if it did, it would be disastrous because so many of us are using these phones. And we just got to keep an eye on things because energy levels will go up a bit. The radio, the distance between waves, the radio frequency will go up a bit. And so we just got to keep on monitoring this. But at this stage, we're not seeing a mass outbreak of anything to do with 5G.
very reassuring. I'm going to call my mum and tell her. Good. Uh, not because she's just, worried. No, just text her or email her on your phone. <laughs> so it's feedback time now. And the yeah. mailbag is full of people wanting to talk about nightshades. So by nightshades, of course, I'm talking about tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, chilies, deadly whole, nightshade also. 2,000 of them. Big Al's partner has Graves' disease, which is like a thyroid malfunction kind of thing, and has been told to avoid all nightshades. However, after your podcast this week, Big Al's wondering if we could elaborate on this because it's really putting a dampener on their culinary options when they're cooking dinner. Well, I think the thing to say is we can't find evidence to find to suggest that the, the, the nightshades as a group are dangerous in terms of your thyroid, that nightshades are described by their appearance rather than necessarily the molecules and the features of them themselves. And so there's sometimes no genetic relationship between a lot of these nightshades. So, so the doctor who's advising that has got to say which nightshades and why. You know, we, we could well be wrong on what's that rash. We, you know, it's happened before. Unlikely, unlikely. But the, uh, it's, it's so generic that... Um, because there's also anti-inflammatory effects of nightshades as well. And when you've got an autoimmune disease, then you might want some of those anti-inflammatory effects. Tom says, well, Tom starts by saying he really enjoys the show. He regards us as the collective Aussie equivalent of Michael Mosley. Oh, right. So that's nice. Uh, Tom was struck by our mention of atropine in last week's show, which it's one of the active compounds in the plant, Baby. Deadly Nightshade. Yeah. Belladonna. Belladonna. Uh, and you mentioned that it's used in medicine these days for, especially for dilating people's pupils when they have like op ophthalmo ophthalmological things going on. And speeding up the heart when the heart is slow. Well, this is what Tom wanted to say. Tom says, for some years now, we've been giving one drop of atropine sulfate per eye to our early teen's daughter in a, an attempt to slow down her increasing short-sightedness. It seems to be working. And he By the way, there's quite good evidence for that. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Half of uh, the Australian equivalent of Michael Mosley. Um, they, he didn't know about the effects on the heart rate. They used a concentration of 0.01%, but in a recent inpatient stay, the hospital supplied 0.1%, i.e. 10 times as much. We soon realised that for those first few nights, her heart must have been racing. It's got palpitations, yeah. And one more one more email on the benefits of potato peel. So you were saying that everyone should peel their potatoes and I didn't admit to you at that time that I don't peel anything. <laughs> uh, and this person says, uh, potato peels full of dietary fibre. It's uh, really important and it's also rich in lots of vitamins, including riboflavin, ascorbic acid, folic acid and vitamin B6. So that's a win for me and no peeling. Well... Look, I think each to his peel. My, uh, my, you know, I, the frequency with which I get green stuff underneath keeps me peeling. Fair enough. Well, but I'm, you know, I'm not a very appealing person. <laughs> You're very appealing to me, Norman. So thanks for watching this, our first video version of What's That Rash? And if you want to see more, subscribe to this channel. And you can also send us your questions and your comments. We are thatrash at abc.net.au. And if you like what you've seen today, you can listen to us anytime on the ABC Listen app. Just search What's That Rash?